Hi everyone, welcome back. It's Professor Hall and today we are looking at a short summary of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Um, after this, uh, you can watch my other lecture examining a little bit more in depth um, some of the questions and themes and facets of this novel. And this is just going to be a summary. And we also have this week a great video from another professor where they go into some of the science of the book in a pretty interesting way. So instead of me talking about the science, you're going to hear it from them. So that should be fun. But let's get started. There we have our author, H.G. Wells, born in 1866 in England. Wells became an avid reader and, and after an accident left him bedridden for several months. Um, as a teenager, he was an apprentice for a few months, but then wanted to turn to teaching and decided to continue his studies. So going to um, further his education as opposed to just going right into the apprenticeship and workforce. He had a scholarship to the Normal School of Science, and there he studied physics, chemistry, astronomy, and biology, things that would inform a lot of his writing later on. And he began to write around this time. His short story, The Chronic Argonox, was published while he was still in college. And then his first novel, The Time Machine, really made him an overnight literary sensation. I thought about having you guys read The Time Machine, but I think that that book is very similar to another book I, I really wanted to have you read, and that's The Princess of Mars. Both of them kind of are scientific romances or science romances in that planetary romance idea of science fiction. Um, and I also think this book, The War of the Worlds, really was a, a seminal classic work that influenced a lot of other stories. So at any rate, in the following years, Wells published a number of other famous books, The Island of Dr. Moreau, The Invisible Man, um, and some of these are um, considered science, scientific romances, which we'll talk about in just a moment. He also, surprisingly, wrote textbooks, short stories, reviews, comedies, and utopian works, although he really is known for his science fiction. After World War I, he became an advocate of world peace, and he wrote some manifestos advocating for peace and for human rights before passing away in 1946. So where does this book fit in terms of subgenres? The scientific romance, um, the scientific fiction is often what it's called when it's smushed together. We talked about that before, the idea of the romantic literary tradition being concerned with the supernatural or gothic elements, having an adventure, um, having some faraway um, places, not in this book, but in others, um, some improbable plots where the reader has to suspend disbelief and that certainly is something that um, readers at the time would have to do with this book. Today we're kind of more used to these types of novels and we're willing to jump right into that world. So here's a depiction of H.G. Wells' uh, other book, The Invisible Man. We have <laughs> The Invisible Man, uh, you can see, running um, with, his, with some of his clothes in his bag. Hard science fiction. Um, this book is concerned with uh, technological advancement, with astronomy, um, and with uh, those hard sciences. So as opposed to the soft sciences like psychology, sociology, anthropology. We talked about that before as well. It's it's also in the subgenre of invasion literature. Um, I'm going to discuss this in my next lecture, but at this point in time, in the late 1800s, there was this kind of concern that British people had that they had invaded a lot of places, and what would it look like if they were invaded? This work, The Battle of Dorking, um, has um, was quite popular at the time. I love this. I'm going to zoom in on this for you guys. No book has ever touched the public conscience more strongly than this. Um, the idea that Germany would invade Britain. Um, there's another book where France invades Britain using um, hot air balloon technology and um, kind of like, uh, which was quite new at the time. And 
fighting from the skies and the British people being uh, trying to cope with this and, and, and trying to figure out how to fight against them. So um, interestingly enough, the idea of alien invasion really was started by this book and um, a culture completely foreign to ours of extraterrestrials coming in, trying to take over or trying to invade for um, beneficial purposes. Here not. Here they are quite villainous and disgusting, which we'll see in a second. But yeah, this book really did start almost a completely new subgenre of science fiction. So for that reason, I think it's, it's, it's worthy of study just for that reason alone. So a little bit of historical background. Um, the book is set in suburban England in the late Victorian period. So just outside of these small towns that are kind of um, surrounding London. There's a little bit of a rural landscape just outside of the town, um, of the suburbs, but essentially it takes place at the time it was written. Um, why is this important? Because some of the film adaptations, particularly the one with Tom Cruise, show this alien invasion taking place now. And if it were to take place now, we have an understanding of robotic technology. We have an understanding today of uh, uh, flying machines, right? Helicopters and planes. And um, we have a concept of a flying saucer, even if we don't have an actual flying saucer on this world. So um, you have to really picture these things that fly and these uh, elect electronics and, and heat rays that are essentially lasers, um, tripods that these ships fall and then they become these tripods that walk through and, and destroy everything. And you have to picture those amongst wooden wagons and horse carts. Um, it's quite a bit different. Another thing to know that at this period of time, as you can see in this picture, um, a lot of works were serialized. They were printed in newspapers or magazines. I'm going to zoom in here real quick. Um, number 84, uh, Charles Dickens, Great Expectations by Charles Dixon, Dickens, a new serial to be continued from week to week and completed in about eight months. So they had um, this there's also an extra Christmas edition in early December. So they have um, this serialization. So chapters end on cliffhangers. This is really important to note because the book does start off a little bit slowly. And then when it picks up speed, it just is a train ride to the end. Um, it's hard to stop once it gets going. But the that's something that I'd like you to look for in terms of the the structure of this story, how each of these incidents really, these episodes kind of um, end on a cliffhanger or help to draw us into the next part in some way. So here are some pictures of Britain around that time, around 1895 to 1900. Um, we have, I think this is Walking, where a lot of the um, story takes place. Um, this is a a little bit of a thoroughfare here. Here is a little bit more. Um, you can see some of the shops and stuff. Um, these would be kind of smaller shops or possibly residences. And then this is another residential street. So yeah, to this little girl playing with her hula hoop um, <laughs> in her in her dress and her hat and her gloves and and they're meeting uh, this this horse drawn uh, carriage here. Um, this idea of these these aliens would be quite um, a bit uh, uh, quite a bit more horrific, I think, than they would be to our imaginations where we've got a lot of these stories, but also a lot more advanced technology, obviously, as well. Um, another little bit of historical background, many American authors of the time focused on strong romantic heroes. We're going to see that next week when we look at A Princess of Mars. That guy is 100% an American hero. Um, they have adventures, they overcome ad adversity based on really determination and grit. And in contrast, a lot of British authors, including H.G. Wells, have kind of a bleaker view of evolution. Man's place in the universe is really in question. If there are aliens, then we're not possibly as important as we think we are. And in evolutionary terms, we might not be the most advanced species. So they 
therefore the hero of this story is unnamed he is powerless and he really is a victim of these natural forces um a lot of writing in america at this time um that was not science fiction um looked at nature and naturalism is a, a literary movement where people are um driven by fate but I think even more than American stories where people are really trying to fight fate and the idea that we can, um, you know, we can be born in poverty and we can grow up to be the president of the United States, which I think historically is not true. But it is an idea that we have in our minds that you can you can be grow up poor and, or be born into poverty and you can become wealthy, that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's a very American idea. So this book is kind of fighting that idea a little bit. And that's something I'd like you to look for in terms of how people perceived at the time these ideas of evolution, what they really meant for society. Um, again, this question of so social structures and social mores kind of being changed by science, um, it, both in the author's life and in the novel. Prior to the novel's publication, American astronomer Percival Lowell published a book on Mars in 1895. His observations on the planet suggested that there were canals on the surface. Many researchers sort of speculated that this might be a sign of sentient life. Um, he looked at them as like waterways, but some people thought that they would be possibly be actual canals. So the book begins with this recent discovery in mind, and it is just an important piece of, of history to note that um, Wells is really working within the understandings of Mars at the time, and then kind of taking that to the next step. Like, so if there was sentient life, what would that look like? How might they interact with us, etc. The book was adapted into a radio play. That's the picture here in 1938 by Orson Welles, not related to H.G. Welles. Um, this is where a lot of people have heard of the War of the Worlds from this radio play. There were newspaper stories saying that it caused a panic. And some people um, may have been uh, not understanding that this was a radio play, but I have to tell you that Orson Welles is working this is the Lux radio hour they have adaptations of movies and books every single week and as you can see here as he's talking there is an orchestra so they announced at the beginning what they were talking about there are advertisements throughout the radio play but I'm going to link it for you in case you want to listen to it because it is quite interesting and you can see um, the way that it's adapted, how people might be kind of fooled into thinking that this is really happening. And, and certainly there were a few people who called in um, worried, um, whether that was, you know, Mabel down the street who's 89 and, and not quite uh, got a little bit of dementia going on. That's not really completely and completely clear. So at least part of the legend is true. And I thought it's, it's worth mentioning because it's really the legend of this story and, and why it was so popular. Here is our hero's journey again. We really do see the call to adventure, um, not on this chart, but certainly on others, the resistance to the call. Um, here, the call to adventure is not to something happy, obviously. The meeting of a mentor is twisted a bit here, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The crossing of the threshold into this adventure when the aliens fully invade, the trials that the 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 unnamed narrator goes through. He does have kind of a death and rebirth. Does he have a revelation? Does he change? Is there an atonement? I don't know if we can follow this perfectly here, but certainly um, he returns changed um, at the end of the story. So I'm going to try to summarize this a bit for you without giving too much away. Um, calling to adventure. I like this picture from DeviantArt um, because it really does show what this kind of is is looking like. We have this suburb, we have a little bit outside of the suburb, and this big cylinder falls. So Mars is closer to Earth than usual. 
a few years before the main action of our story begins. Um, we have Mars coming closer to Earth because of some astronomical conditions. The narrator sees a series of flashes and he talks to his friend Ogilvy. Now, Ogilvy is kind of set up to be like a mentor. Um, he understands the science of the planet more than most people. And so we sort of have this expectation that Ogilvy is going to lead our narrator through this story or that he might be the hero of the tale. The two friends witness the flashes and then they go to an observatory. They debate whether this could mean that there is life on Mars. Later, there are falling stars that appear all over England. One of these falling stars or what people think is a falling star is this cylinder which crashes near the narrator's home in the small town of Maybury. The book really starts slowly. We have talked about this with other early science fiction works that the, the, the authors felt a need to bring the reader into the story and to help them suspend their disbelief. And it is slow in the beginning, but there are some details there about the narrator's everyday life that I would like you to look for. Um, but eventually, people kind of find it boring that there's this cylinder. It's a big hunk of metal. It fell to the earth. We went and looked at it. What else is there to say? And I find this part of the book unintentionally hilarious because at one point, um, some stuff happens and the narrator just like leaves and goes home and has supper and has like a normal weekend and I can't imagine today if alien anything crashed to the earth even if it was a meteorite not even an alien ship that would be like a big deal um and I think again that's because of the serialization so People are finding it boring until the cylinder opens and we see these octopus-like creatures with these maws and tentacles and gray-brown skin that glistens like wet leather and their lipless mouths. Um, what I think is interesting is the way that aliens are described. In this book especially, they are kind of as far away from humanity as you can get. And that's going to be quite important. I'll talk about that later in uh, the analysis of the work of why that might be. But this is not unusual to have kind of like something that looks like an octopus or squid or sometimes a bug. Um, in Orson Scott Card's book Ender's Game, they're called buggers um, because they look more like bugs. So again, things that are on the earth that we feel like are different from us and we can't relate to in the way that we move or the way that we think. Um, the Martians emerge and then they retreat. Some people flee from the hideous creatures. A small group takes a white flag as a sign of peace. Ogilvy is part of this group and they are quickly killed by a heat ray, which is essentially a laser beam. So the only mentor that the narrator had up until this point is dead. And it, again, is this idea that, you know, this guy is driven by fate to kind of go on this um, adventure unwillingly um, alone. And he really is a normal, everyday guy. He's not a scientist. He's not um, an expert in these things. So then we have the challenges and the temptations. This is a depiction of a tripod the Martian fighting machine, again, with some tentacles, but also these three legs. So the heat ray attack really sets off a war between the people and the extraterrestrials. Like many others, um, the narrator runs in terror. And then again, he goes home, has dinner, and has a pretty typical weekend. The idea is kind of like, well, like the military will take care of it. And certainly the military does come and they are able in part to defeat some of these machines. I think that's important too to say, well, we don't have nothing. Like we have guns, we could maybe have a chance, but it's pretty clear that um, they're outmanned and outgunned. So they think that the military is going to take care of the problem, but realizing the severity of the situation, he travels to a new a nearby town. He leaves his wife with some family and then he has to return this um, cart that he has 
rented or borrowed. It's a little bit of a plot device to kind of get him separated from his family. The military forces arrive. They're outmatched. There's heat rays. The, the, the Martians begin using chemical weapons, this black smoke. The narrators also then see that these cylinders have become fighting machines. These huge tripods that are just destroying everything in their, their path. And then we come to the darkest point, the life under the Martians. I'm going to zoom in here. I love this depiction. This is from one of the, I think the TV movie version. Um, you know, we have horse carts here and wagons. We have one very early car, but um, the these are the, the tripods. I love this depiction of the tripods. Sorry to be on that for longer than I needed to, but I just, I think they look so cool. Um, this is a great depiction of the aliens themselves. These like, ugh squid kind of like creatures that don't look like us and there's no exact tentacles here but they kind of look like the machines above right um so the narrator is swept up in this wave of exiles trying to escape london he meets a curate now if you go back and look at the hero's journey a lot of times at this point right before or right after the abyss the narrator or the the hero rather will get some kind of supernatural aid so there will be someone who comes and um it acts as a um acts as a, another mentor for them or as a helper and here again twisting that idea this person is not going to be of any help um a curate is a pastor a minister or sometimes an assistant to a minister um and he really is more of a hindrance than anything so you have someone with scientific knowledge who should have been an expert and helped the narrator now you have someone with religious knowledge who should have been of help to the narrator and again an expert and a mentor and and really both of them fail the narrator that's quite important to the story we also hear about the narrator's brother who's also unnamed He's traveling with some other refugees. So the second book, or rather the second half of the book, the narrator's unsure whether his wife is alive or dead. He comes to really this lowest point. He's plundering houses with the curate in search of food and shelter. They witness these Martians seizing men and putting them into metallic containers, and they realize that the Martians are using people almost like cattle. They're capturing humans, and they're transfusing their blood as nourishment. Um, there's also a red weed that appears to be an attempt to terraform the planet. And I, I, I think that that idea, especially for this time, is like amazing that that he kind of thought about this the martian um if you saw the movie or read the book there there have been a lot of speculation now of whether we could terraform a planet but the idea of an alien race doing that to us to me is fascinating so um the narrator basically surmises that the martians have used up all the resources on their planet and now they're planning to um, plunder earth and use the earth's resources and kind of put humanity under enslavement and and take over the world um <laughs> the tom cruise movie the end of it um sorry it's just not that great but i do like dakota fanning um i'm not <laughs> i'm not a fan of that particular film but eventually there's a type of return for our unnamed hero i don't want to give too many details away about what exactly happens because i don't want to have too many spoilers for you guys but he's nursed back to health at the end he's changed he's haunted um, my other lecture, I talk a little bit more about the end and kind of the meaning of the end, but he believes that the attack might have been beneficial in some ways, that, that humanity has learned from this. At the same time, he has this abiding sense of doubt and insecurity, and that's where the book ends, in this really, this place of unknowing. Um, and it's, it's a really good example of how science fiction kind of asks questions and says, hey, there, there are not easy answers to these questions. What would technology be like? Um, how would that affect people? How would it affect one person? How would it affect society as a whole? We can't answer these questions very easily. So um, 
yeah, <laughs> so that's the book, and I, I really, I hope that you enjoy it. So read a likes. Um, if you like early science fiction, The Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne, um, From the Earth to the Moon, also by Jules Verne. Those are some great early science fiction books. The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury um, are some interesting short stories, one of which um, I just love this well, I won't get into it. I'll let you guys discover. But uh, they're really great short stories. The Martian, as I mentioned by Andy Weir, is about um, a man who goes uh, on a mission to terraform Mars and is stranded there um, away from the rest of his crew. Stranger in a Strange Land is about a Martian coming to Earth um, and how he is treated on Earth. So it's a little bit of a kind of a reverse of this story. Hitchhiker's Guide, the Earth is destroyed, but kind of in a funny way to make room for a highway. Um, <laughs> the adventures that the person has, if you want a little bit funnier look at a space odyssey or a space opera. The Day the Earth Stood Still and Childhood's End both take the idea of alien invasion and kind of twist it around why are the aliens here are they going to help us are they going to hurt us um i think you could almost look at them as as really being almost completely inspired by by this book by war of the worlds and saying um well what if this happened but what if it happened in a little bit of a different way so um yeah I hope that you like this book. I hope you check some of these other books out. And next time I will talk more about some of the scientific and social science aspects of War of the Worlds. And we'll dig into the book in a little bit more depth. Thanks, everybody.